Hi, and welcome to the first part of this tutorial where we will be creating a Tetris game using Java. Our game will consist of a startup form that allows the user to start playing the game, check the leaderboard, or quit the game. The game itself will keep track of the score and grow in difficulty as we play it. At the end of the game, the player will be asked to type in his or her name, and that name will be displayed in the leaderboard that we can access from the startup form. In this tutorial, we'll be heavily relying on the material covered in the previous videos. So if at some point it gets difficult for you to follow, I recommend that you refer to the previous videos before proceeding with this tutorial. It's important that you understand what we'll be doing in this tutorial. Otherwise, it won't be as exciting and enjoyable. This tutorial consists of nine steps. First, we'll have the program draw a Tetris block on the form. Then we'll have that block fall down and have the program spawn a new block when the current one hits the ground. After that, we'll make our program move and rotate the falling block when we press a keyboard key and clear complete lines. We will also make sure our game has all standard Tetris block types and a leaderboard whose data is properly saved. Finally, we'll add sounds to make our game a bit more playable. We've got a lot to do, so let's get to work, shall we? First, let's create a new project in NetBeans and name it Tetris. For now, let's tidy up the Tetris class and close it until sometime later. To the Tetris package, let's add a JFrame form. and name it game form. This will be the main form of our game. Let's switch to source mode, clean up the code a little, and look at the game form class declaration. Specifically, let's look at the part that says extends javax.swing.jframe. First of all, what is javax.swing.jframe? JavaX is a package. Swing is another package inside the JavaX package. And JFrame is a class inside the Swing package. We can in fact get rid of the JavaX.Swing part. But if we do that, we will have to import the JFrame class into our project, like this. The bottom line is JFrame is a class. GameForm is a class as well. And classes in Java can extend other classes. In our program, we have the GameForm class extend the JFrame class. What does this mean? It means that GameForm is a somewhat more advanced version of JFrame. It also means that GameForm inherits from JFrame. Inheritance is one of the cornerstone principles of object oriented programming. Simply put, classes can extend or inherit from other classes. The class that inherits from another class is called subclass, while the class that's been inherited from is called superclass. Let's look at some practical benefits of using inheritance. Some of you are already familiar with this line of code. Here, a new game form object is created and made visible. To make it visible, the setVisible method is used, but where does the setVisible method come from? We haven't created it. In fact, it's not even declared in the GameForm class. Why are we able to use it then? Well, setVisible method is an instance method of JFrame class. And we can use it in GameForm class because GameForm inherits the method from the JFrame class. Just to be a bit more precise, the JFrame class itself inherits the setVisible method from yet another class called Window. In other words, subclasses inherit some of the superclasses members including methods, which in turn means that subclasses can use some of the superclasses methods as their own. Remember, too much of copy-pasted code is bad, and inheritance is one of the ways to reduce the amount of copy-pasted code. Since GameForm is a JFrame, we can use JFrame's setVisible method without creating a separate setVisible method for GameForm. Now let's talk in a bit more detail about what exactly subclasses inherit from superclasses. In Java, subclasses inherit public and protected members, which means that subclasses gain access to public and protected members of their superclasses. 
What else can a subclass do with inherited members in addition to accessing them? One thing a subclass can do with an inherited method, which is a member, is it can override that method. Overriding a method means providing a different body for the method. Now, how can we use this in our game? A first step is to have a program draw a Tetris block on the form. And one way to have a program draw something on the form is to create a custom class that extends another class and overrides one of that class's methods. There are several classes we can extend to achieve our goal, but perhaps the easiest one is JPanel. So let's add a new Java class to the Tetris package and name the class Game Area. Now let's have this Game Area class extend the JPanel class, like this. Let's not forget to import JPanel. Our current goal is to have a game form, form with a Game Area panel that can draw Tetris blocks. So let's do it. To be able to draw something on the J panel, we need to override its paint component method. To override the method in a subclass, we simply need to declare a method whose header is the same as the header of the method we want to override. And you can see the header of the paint component method on the screen. Some of you might ask, how do I know that I need to extend J panel and override its paint component method? Well, nowadays, quite a bit of programming is done via Googling. If we Google how to draw on JFrame, we'll quickly find that we need to extend a class and override one of its methods, which of course isn't much of help if you don't know how to extend classes and how to override methods. So one reason why we cover theory on this channel is to make it easier for you to understand the meaning of how-tos that you find online. So to override the pain component method in our game area class, we need to add a method with the same header. And of course, we need to import the graphics class. This graphics G guy is a painter that will be responsible for drawing stuff in our game area. As a side note, to make sure that you're correctly overriding a method, we can add an override annotation immediately before the header of the method we are overriding, like this. And now if we, for example, misspell the name of the method, NetBeans will yell at us, which is useful because now we know that we're not overriding the pain component method correctly. Alright, now we can have this graphics G guy draw stuff on the panel. Let's go G dot and wait to see what options we have. Just to see how it works, let's draw a square on the panel using the fill rect method, which stands for a fill rectangle. The method takes four parameters that define the position of the rectangle, its width, and height. For now, let's set its position to 0, 0, width and height to 50. Now, what do we do with this game area? Well, first of all, we need to instantiate it and add it to the game form. Otherwise, we won't be able to see it. How do we do that? Let's switch to game form class. And in the constructor, let's create a game area object and add it to the form using the add method. The add method, just like the set visible method, is an inherited method. And it does just what its name suggests. It adds components to the form. Here we use the keyword this, which is optional. And as some of you might remember, the keyword this refers to the current instance of the GameForm class. If you would like to know a bit more about the keyword this, please refer to the previous video. So if we now run the GameForm, we will see that nothing gets drawn on the form. Why? This might not make much sense to you, but the game area object that we add to the form has no width and no height. In other words, if you want to see the rectangle, we must make sure that the J panel has a non zero size. Because when the size of the J panel is zero, nothing on that J panel is visible. To fix this, let's open the game area class, add a constructor, and in the constructor, Let's define the position and size of the game area using the setBounds method. For now, let's do it like this, and later I will explain what it means. 
You might have noticed that it looks pretty similar to the fillRect method call that we added to the pain component method earlier. And if you run the game form file now, we will see the black square, which means that our game area works. So we have created a new class, game area, that inherits from jpanel. We have overridden the pain component method of the jpanel class and made it draw a square. And when we run the game form file, a new game area object is created. Its position on the form is set to 0, 0, while its width and height are set to 100. And then the game area object is added to the game form object. Now let's make the game area object a bit more prominent by changing its background color using the set background method inside the game area constructor, like this. Here, color is yet another Java class that needs to be imported. And red is a static member of the color class that represents the color red. Now if you run game form, we will see that the background of the game area hasn't changed. To fix this, we need to add this line of code to the paint component method of the game area class. First, let's run the game form to make sure it works, and I will explain what we just did a bit later. So now that we can see the game area object on the form, let's talk about some technical details. By setting the location of the game area to 0, 0, we place the top left corner of the game area at 0, 0 of the game form and 0, 0 is the top left corner of the game form. If we want to shift the game area to the right, we should increase its x position. And if we want to move it down, we should increase its y position. Looks similar to what we did in the programming with Scratch video series, doesn't it? Let's now set the position of game area to, say, 100 by x and 50 by y, and run the game form to see what it looks like. And we can see that the red game area has now moved away from the top left corner of the form. Now, similarly, inside the game area, we have a black square which is located at 0, 0, the top left corner of the game area, and has the width and height of 50. Before we move on, please make sure it's clear to you how this positioning works, otherwise it might get even more confusing as we go. Now, what's the meaning of this super dot pain component method call? When overriding a method, we can choose to sort of keep the original method and add some extra functionality to it. Keeping the original method basically means that we call the original method inside the overridden method. But simply calling the method by its name will result in calling the method of the subclass, not the method of the superclass. Because both the original and the overridden methods have the same name, we need something to tell them apart. That something is the keyword super. So this whole line of code means that we are calling the pain component method of this superclass, which in our case is jpanel. All right, why do we need to call the superclasses version of pain component, some of you might ask. Well, we had to do that because without this method call, the background of the game area wouldn't become red. In other words, if I comment this line out, making that means ignore it, and run game form, the red background of the game area will not be drawn. And if I delete these slashes, making that means treat this line as code, and run game form again, we will be able to see the red background of the game area. In other words, the pane component method that our game area inherits is responsible for drawing background. And if we need that functionality, we should call the pane component method using the keyword super. All right, now back to the bounds of game area. What should we set the position and size of the game area to? We can play with numbers to try to find something that we like, or we can take a more visual approach. Let's open the game form in design mode and add a J panel to the form, like this. We can now figure out the position and size of the panel in design mode, and then make the game area object have the same position and size. Let's make this panel this big and place it here. We can now use this panel as a placeholder for the game area object, so let's name it respectively. Now we can modify the game area constructor so that it takes a J panel as a parameter, like this. And inside the constructor, we set the bounds of game area 
to the bounds of the placeholder and make the placeholder itself invisible. Now we need to switch over to the GameForm class and pass the game area constructor the JPanel placeholder that we added to the form, like this. And now if we run GameForm, we will see that the game area has the position and size of the placeholder panel. And if we change position or size of the placeholder, the game area will adjust accordingly. Now let's also get the background color and the border for the game area object from the placeholder. If we now switch over to game form, change the background, and the border of the placeholder, our game area object will copy those. Feel free to choose any background color or border for your game area. I'm going to reset the background color back to its default though by setting the color to 238, 238, 238. And I'll we'll keep a simple line border. I like things to be simple. So we now have a game area with a black square in the top left corner. The square drawing code is located in the paint component method. However, and I believe some of you have realized this, we do not call the paint component method in our code. And since we don't, why does the black square get drawn? Simply put, the paint component method is called by another system that also provides it with the graphics G guy. In other words, we do not need to call the paint component method directly. We only need to specify what must be drawn, and then some other system will call the method and draw whatever we want to be drawn. Now let's get back to our game area. A play field of a Tetris game is effectively a grid. And before we continue, we need to figure out how many rows and columns it will have, as well as the size of a single grid cell. Without this information, we won't be able to draw the game area properly. And it's a bit of math time now. A grid cell is a square, meaning it has four sides equal in length. The size of a grid cell is, therefore, the width of the grid divided by the number of columns, or the height of the grid, divided by the number of rows. Let's try doing this math in the game area class now. Let's declare three private instance variables that will store the number of rows and columns in the grid and the size of a grid cell. Now, where do we initialize the variables? Doing that inside a constructor seems to be quite logical. Let's calculate the size of a grid cell using the width of the game area. The width of the game area is a part of the bounds that we set in the constructor. To get the width, we can call the getBounds method and access the width, like this. And we'll divide the width by, right, the number of columns. The question is, where do we get the number of columns? How about we pass it as a parameter to the game area constructor, like this. Now remember, method parameters are effectively variables declared inside the method. And variables declared inside the method are not visible outside that method. This is why we need to assign the value of the columns variable to the grid columns variable. And since we now have the size of a grid cell, we can calculate the number of rows. How do we do that? Right. We divide the height of the game area by the size of a grid cell, like this. And now we can draw the grid by adding some code inside the paint component method. The question is, what code do we need to add? So we know that our Tetris grid consists of square cells. To draw a single square cell, we can call the drawRect method of the graphics class. 
In the method, just like fill rect takes four parameters, two for the x and y coordinates of the cell, and two for the width and height of the cell. So how do we draw a grid then? We can draw a grid either by column or by row, doesn't really matter. I say we draw it by row just because I think it's more intuitive. In other words, we can view a grid as a bunch of rows where each row is a bunch of cells. How do we draw a bunch of identical cells? We can call the draw rec method a bunch of times, or better yet, we can call the draw rec method inside a right loop. First of all, let's get rid of this square drawing code. We only use it for reference and now it's useless. To draw a row in a loop, we need to know how many cells or how many columns make up a row. Do we know that? Yes, we do. We store that number in the grid columns variable. So our row drawing code can look like this. Now the question is, what parameters do we need to pass to the draw rect method? Well, first of all, the width and height must be set to right grid cell size. Now what should the x and y coordinates be? If we set them to say 0, 0, we will get a bunch of cells drawn on top of one another, all at 0, 0. To prevent that from happening, every iteration of the loop, we need to change the position at which the cell must be drawn, and the x position of the cell should be x times grid cell size. Why? Let's look at this example. We already know that the x and y coordinates of this point in the top left corner are 0. How about this P1 point? What would its x and y coordinates be? Since the horizontal distance between P1 and the top left corner equals the size of the cell, the x coordinate of P1 is equal to the number stored in the grid cell size variable. And the y coordinate of P1 is 0 because there is no vertical displacement for P1 from the top left corner. Now how about P2? Because the horizontal distance between P2 and the top left corner is equal to two cell sizes, the x coordinate of P2 is two times grid cell size, and the y coordinate is still zero. In other words, every iteration, the x coordinate should be increased by the size of the cell. And multiplying the loop counter x by the size of a grid cell is one way of doing that. Let's now switch over to the game form class. Set the number of columns for the game area object to, say, 10, and run the file. To see a single row drawn in the game area. How do we draw more rows? Well, to draw more rows, we need to repeat the row join code. And we can do that by using another loop, like this. The termination condition for this outer loop is y is smaller than grid rows because we don't want the program to draw more rows than needed. Now, what do we do with this y loop counter? Any ideas? Look at the draw rec method call for a hint. Right, the y coordinate of a grid cell should also be dependent on the loop counter. Specifically, it should be y times grid cell size. And now, if you run game form, we will see a grid. Before I move on, please look at the code and make sure it's clear to you how it works. Watch this video again if you need. Now, let's run game form again to see that the grid is a bit smaller than the game area. You can see the sort of double line on the right. To make the grid fit in the game area perfectly, we need to adjust the size of the game area. If we switch to design mode and try to resize the placeholder panel, we will see its size as we resize it. So to make sure the grid fits in the game area nicely, we need to make sure that the width of the game area is divisible by the number of columns. Since we set the number of columns to 10, the width of the game area must be divisible by 10. How about 200 for now? And now the grid fits in nicely in the game area, but only horizontally. To make it fit vertically as well, we need to modify the height 
of the game area, so that it's divisible by the size of a grid cell. Since the size of a grid cell is 200 over 10, which is 20, the height of the game area must be divisible by 20. How about 300? Now let's make sure the game area is centered on game form. To do that, we need to make sure that the horizontal gaps on the left and on the right of the game area are the same. Let's double click on the right gap and set it to say 150. Let's also set the left gap to 150. To be nice and neat, let's also make sure the game area is centered vertically on the form by moving the bottom edge of the form upward a little bit. And we can also make the form unresizable and centered at launch. All right, so we have a Tetris grid on the form. How do we draw Tetris blocks in the grid? A Tetris block, just like a grid, has a width and a height. So we can view a Tetris block as a grid as well, with some cells being colored and some not. Now, what data type can we use to represent a grid in a computer program? A grid is a collection of cells, and in our case, a cell can be either colored or not. If you say it sounds like a boolean, you're absolutely right. But we can also use the type int to specify whether a particular cell is colored or not. 1 can mean that the cell is colored, whereas 0 can mean that the cell is not colored. Alright, so a Tetris block is a collection of cells, where each of the cells can be represented by an int number. If you think that the word collection is giving you a hint, you're absolutely right. We can view a Tetris block as an int array. The question is, how do we represent a grid using an array? A grid is a two-coordinate system. It has a vertical or y-coordinate and a horizontal or x-coordinate. In other words, every grid cell has two numbers that define the location of the cell inside the grid. An array, however, has only one number, the index, to specify the location of a particular element inside the array. This was a long theoretical prologue to a simple practical solution. Instead of using a regular array, we will use an array of arrays to represent Tetris blocks. In other words, we can view a grid as a collection of int arrays, where each of the int arrays represents a row of the grid. To declare an array variable, we just add a pair of square brackets right after the data type of the array. And since we want to declare an array whose data type is int array, we end up having two pairs of square brackets following the word int. Just a side note, in fact, we can further nest arrays, like this. Alright, let's declare an array of int arrays variable in the game area class and name it block. Now let's instantiate an array of arrays that will represent an L-shaped Tetris block. An L-shape can be represented by a grid consisting of three rows, which means we need an array of three int arrays, where each of the int arrays stores two elements. Does anybody remember what this kind of array instantiation is called? Right, it's an instantiation with predefined values. If you're not sure what this means, I recommend that you refer to the previous videos of this video series. Now that we have something that represents a Tetris block, let's draw it in the game area. Let's be neat and create a separate method for that. Let's make it private and void, and name it draw block. Because we need a graphics due to draw, let's have our draw block method take it as a parameter. Inside this method, we need to traverse the block array, and if the element of the array is 1, we will draw a filled square in the game area. And to traverse an array of arrays, we need what? Right, a loop. A nested for loop to be more specific, just like what we use to draw the grid. The outer loop will use the length of the block array as its termination condition. And the inner loop will use the length of the first row array as its termination condition. Inside the loop, we check whether the element of the block array equals to 1, which means that it's colored. And if it is, we draw a filled square by calling the fillRect method. For the x-coordinate, we will use the value of the variable call multiplied by, right, the size of a grid cell, just like we did to have the grid drawn in the game area. 
And for the y coordinate, it should be rho times grit cell size. For the width and height, it should be right grit cell size for both. Let's now call the draw block method inside pane component method and run game form. To see a black L shaped block in the top left corner of the game area. Let's now change the color of the block. To do that, we need to call the setColor method on the G before we draw a square, like this. Now let's remove the grid lines from the game area and draw grid lines on top of the block by calling the drawRect method inside the loop, like this. Any ideas why we don't see the grid lines on top of the red block? We don't see them because their color is red. And it's red because we set it to red here. So to be able to see the grid lines, let's set the color back to black before the draw rect method call. And now we have a Tetris style block in the top left corner of the game area. So step one, complete. Now let's summarize what we learned in this video. We learned that classes can extend other classes, and by doing so, they inherit public and protected members of those classes. Subclasses, also known as child classes, gain access to the members they inherit from superclasses, also known as parent classes. In addition to that, subclasses can override inherited methods. By overriding a method, the subclass provides its own implementation for the method. In case a subclass overrides a method, it can still access the superclasses version of that method by using the keyword super. In addition to inheritance and method overriding, we practice using the drawRect and fillRect methods of the graphics class to have a program draw on a J panel. We also learned that we can use an array of arrays to represent a grid. And in our program, we use an array of int arrays to represent a Tetris block. It's been a while I haven't mentioned my favorite mantra, that the only thing computers do is they process data. Why did I bring this up again? To draw your attention to the fact that having the computer draw a grid on the screen is not very much different from having it print hello. Here, the string is data, and the println method processes the data by printing it. And if you want the computer to draw a grid, you pass necessary numbers to the drawRect method inside a nested loop, and voila! The only difference between these two examples is that it's more difficult to make sense of the data that you need to pass to the drawRect method. It's not as straightforward as passing a string to the println method. But again, let me repeat, there is no essential difference between the two. Both methods take some data and do something with it. My point here is that when you're trying to figure out how to make the computer do something, you should think, one, what data you need to have the computer process, and two, how that data must be processed. And quite often you will come across multiple ways to achieve the same result, and the only difference between them would be the data set that they require and the processing that that data must undergo. For example, we chose an array of int arrays to represent a Tetris block. But computers don't know what a Tetris block is unless they've been specifically taught that. This means that we can use any data, in any form, to represent a Tetris block. Instead of an array of int arrays, we could go with a regular array of boolean. The drawing code would have been somewhat different, but we could still achieve the same result. Let me repeat my point before we wrap up this video. When writing a program, you need to think what data you need and how you need to process that data. I don't mean to say that programming is easy, but I do want to emphasize that there is no magic involved in making computer programs. So if what we did in this video seems overwhelming, there is nothing to be frustrated about or ashamed of. Take your time trying to see the logic behind every decision we've made and every line of code we've written. And if you do that, I'm sure it will get less overwhelming. And this is it for this video. In the next one, we'll make our Tetris block move in the game area. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.